Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are watching this lecture. It is my great honor to speak to colleagues and friends from the Harvard Asian Studies community and beyond. My name is Xie Kan Kan, Assistant Professor of Southeast Asian Studies at Peking University in China. My research and teaching deal with various historical and contemporary issues of the broadly defined Nusantara, including Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. I'm particularly interested in the region's left-wing movements, the intersection of colonialism, nationalism, and decolonization, as well as ethnicity and identity politics. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Harvard Asia Center for the kind invitation. I also want to express my sincere appreciation to Professor Anata Damayanti Lino for hosting my talk. I also want to thank Chu Yang and Jorg Espada for coordinating the event. I'm giving this lecture from my office in Beijing, but I'm sure I will have a great deal to learn from the audience. I'd be happy to take questions and comments after the talk. My presentation today is entitled Ambivalent Fatherland, the Chinese National Salvation Movement in Malaya and Java from 1937 to 1941. I'm going to divide my presentation into four parts. In part one, I'm going to give a general introduction and a basic introduction to the historical background. In part two, I'm going to talk about the National Salvation Movement in British Malaya. In part three, I'm going to talk about the same movement and how it unfolded in the Dutch-controlled colony of Java. In part four, I'll conclude and talk about my major observations. First, I'll start with the intro and the background. The Sino-Japan military conflict escalated into a full-scale war after the Marco Polo Bridge incident in 1937 in China. At that time, Western powers hesitated to intervene in the increasingly aggravated China-Japan hostility. Nevertheless, such a conflict sparked the rise of Chinese nationalism in Chinese diaspora communities worldwide. Particularly important is that the conflict stimulated the rise of National Salvation Movement, or NSM, in Southeast Asia, which included numerous fundraising campaigns, boycott campaigns, and anti-Japanese propaganda. Here, I'd like to share two pie charts, Chinese population in the 1930s. The chart on the left was the population composition in British Maya. In the early 1930s, the Chinese population reached 1.7 million, which accounted for almost 40% of the total population. In Dutch Java, the number was comparable. The Chinese population reached 1.2 million. More than half of them lived in Java, but they only accounted for less than 2% of the total population. The overwhelming majority of the Java population was still indigenous. So uh, this is a huge distinction between two colonies, which I'll elaborate later. So a number of scholars have conducted research on this topic. This is an uh, extensively researched topic in the Sinophone world, but the Chinese language narratives often primarily focus on the Ai Guo or patriotism aspect of the salvation movement. Such narratives often highlight the achievement of the overseas community and often portray the unquestioned solidarity in such communities. Scholars like Yoji Akashi and Harvard's very own Philip Kuhn and Indonesian scholar Didi Kwatanata have conducted research which highlighted the diversity within the overseas Chinese community. Particularly important in their research is that they argued there was a basic Toto Peranakan divide in the Chinese communities. Toto are basically the first generation immigrants to the colonies who were born in China and migrated to South Asia later. Peranakan are local born Chinese who have been living in South Asia for generations. Toto are considered maintaining very close ties to their ancestral homeland. 
So as a result, they are more patriotic and more actively involved in the national salvation movement. By comparison, uh, Bert Anak are primarily concerned with local politics. They care less about political environment in China. And these scholars argue that the total Pranagan divide shaped the basic pattern of the National Salvation Movement at that time. William Skinner conducted comparative research on National Salvation Movement in British Malaya and Thailand. Skinner argued that total Chinese in Malaya were more radical because they were exposed to more radical ideas in colonial society but such ideas were almost non-existent in Thailand at that time. Skinner also suggested that the Cantonese were more revolution-minded than other groups because they maintained close ties to the political activities in their hometown in Guangdong, uh, which were more revolutionary. But such narratives also have their shortcomings. For example, in Malaya, the non-revolutionary business leaders, especially those of Fujianese origin, played a key role in the National Salvation Movement. And in Java, uh, many Anagan groups actively participated in the National Salvation Movement, and they care about the political environment activities in, back in China, whereas many new immigrants actually turn blind eyes to fundraising and boycott campaigns out of their own interests. So neither birthplace nor dialect groups affiliations alone could determine people's level if, of involvement in the National Salvation Movement. Uh, what is actually happening was that the individuals actually took actions not only based on their varying relationship with China, but also distinct and often shifting environments where they lived. So there are several questions I asked in this research. The first is how did diasporic groups' multi-layered identities affect their participation in a highly politicized movement orienting towards a distant and ambivalent homeland, that is China? And secondly, how did colonial states' political, economic, and social conditions shaped overseas Chinese communities' perceptions of, and subsequently, their reactions to the ambiguously articulated national salvation. And thirdly, where did nationalism and patriotism start and end in such contexts? In this research, I have several key arguments. The first is that the changing political, economic, and social circumstances in local societies prompted diasporic communities to make swift adjustments. And the second argument is that overseas Chinese shifting relationships with their ethnic homeland and their host colonial states profoundly affected how the National Salvation Movement played out. The National Salvation Movement's outcomes shaped how the Japanese deal with different Chinese groups during the occupation. Basically, the Japanese military administration conducted radical purges against those who actively participated in the movement and gave relatively lenient treatment to those who did not. I'll elaborate in later sections. In this part, I'm going to talk about how the NSM played out in British Malaya. First, there was fierce competition between Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party of China, and CPC, and an extension, uh, Malayan Communist Party. The Kuomintang and the Communist Party of China formed the second alliance uh, after 1937 in China, but such an alliance did not fully extend to Malaya. There was still fierce competition for NSM leadership between the Kuomintang and MCP groups. Uh, the Kuomintang branches in Malaya believed that the British was a sympathetic power to China. So the National Salvation Movement must be carried out based on Sino-British friendship. By contrast, the Malayan Communist Party believed that they have to adopt more aggressive approach 
to NSM campaigns. They needed to challenge British rule in the colony while conducting anti-Japanese activities. Along the process, one man stand out as the backbone of the NSM leadership. That man was Tankaki. He was neither a Kuomintang nor MCP member, but a non-partisan community leader. He was a Fujianese business tycoon, and then at that time, the Malayan Chinese business community experienced unprecedented challenges from Japanese firms, which was driven by state-sponsored economic expansion policies conducted, implemented across Southeast Asia. Therefore, the real threats posed by the Japanese substantiated the initially abstract nationalistic sentiment of the business community. And Tankaki took this opportunity to become the leader of the Chinese community in Malaya. And here is a quote from Tankaki. He said, if someone knows that the enemy is COVID-19 Nanyang, Southeast Asia, this person will be aware that our business here is under threat and that Nanyang has to be defended. To defend Nanyang, however, we must defend our fatherland first. The situation in Nanyang will get better when our fatherland gets better. When the fatherland obtains victory, Nanyang will be automatically defended. Here, it is obvious that Tankaki is connecting the destiny of overseas Chinese to the destiny of the fatherland, China, as he believes that the two are closely associated with each other. But equally important, is the changing British attitude towards the China-oriented National Salvation Movement. Initially, the British tried to stay out of the China-Japan military conflict. However, as the war continued in China, the British realized that Japan, the Japanese aggression, posed enormous threats to British interests in the entire Far East. Therefore, the NSM in Malaya gained certain leeway in organizing fundraising campaigns as long as it doesn't affect the order of the colonial society. Here's a quote from British colonial official. He wrote, Following upon open committal of Japanese policy towards association with Axis, you will have appreciated that our support of Chiang Kai-shek and his resistance to Japan has assumed new importance. He continued, It is important that this policy should be reflected in the attitude of the Malayan authorities to free China and its leaders. Although it is not desired, of course, that this should take forms unnecessarily provocative to Japan, it will be in conformity with general policy of His Majesty's government if relations with Chinese government's represent re representatives should be as sympathetic and helpful as possible. Here, uh, I saw two important messages. The first is the action shouldn't be too provocative to Japan, but the second the Malayan authorities need to behave as sympathetic and helpful as possible towards the activities conducted by the Chinese community in the colony. As a result, under the leadership of Tankaki, the Nanqiao Zonghui or the Nanyang Federation of China Relief Fund was established. And the um, the main objective of this fund was to unite the vast overseas Chinese community across Southeast Asia. However, out of its 21 executive members, 17 of them were Fujianese, uh, basically countrymen of Tankaki, and 16 of them were actually from Malaya. So Malaya was very well represented in this fund in this federation, uh, but other colonies, other territories in Southeast Asia 
or not. And uh, the campaigns of this Nan Chao Zonghui was very effective. In addition to fundraising activities, they also managed to recruit more than 3,000 volunteer drivers and mechanics for China's war efforts. Basically, these drivers and mechanics uh, worked along the Yunnan Burma Road to carry important uh, war supplies from India to China inland. Uh, as the NSM unfolded, the leadership of the movement gradually shifted towards the communist side. First of all, uh, Tangaki himself visited China in 1940, but gradually his so-called pro-communist tendency enraged the Kuomintang administration in China, who threatened to replace him uh, through the Kuomintang agents in Malaya in the Nanyang Federation uh, of China Relief Fund. Uh, however, Tan Kaki enjoyed the const constant support from Nanyang Shangbao, Malaya's most popular Chinese language newspaper, whose readership was primarily Fujianese. Uh, what is important is that uh, communist intellectual Hu Yuzhi took over the editor-in-chief position in 1940 as said, although Hu Yuzhi himself is a communist, but he supported Tan Kaki as a non-partisan leader in his efforts of organizing a national salvation movement. So Hu Yuzhi promoted solidarity of the Chinese population, even advocated for the cooperation with a wide array of foreign forces, which included British and American. I'm going to talk about the National Salvation Movement in Dutch Java. Unlike the situation in Malaya, most of the Chinese population in Java were still Pranagan, who were born in the Dutch East Indies. According to the 1930 census, the last and only comprehensive one conducted in, by a Dutch colonial state, Pranagan accounted for almost 80% of the Chinese population in Java. Here's the pie chart. Uh, as we can tell, ethnic Chinese only accounted for a tiny minority of the entire population in Java. But within this 2%, the overwhelming majority were local born Bernagan. The new immigrants only consisted less than one quarter of the total. That being said, there was still the dominance of Pranagan elites in local Chinese politics. Presumably, the local borns were less concerned with the political situation in China than were the new immigrants who still maintain closer ties with their hometowns. And similarly, scholars also suggest that the Pranagan dominated Chinese community in Java was less enthusiastic about participating in the National Salvation Movement than their Toto, the new immigrant's majority counterparts in Malaya. However, as I will demonstrate in this section, the situation on the ground was far more complex than the apparent Pranakan Toto divide. And first of all, it is important to note that the idea of the so-called national identity was extremely fluid in the Dutch East Indies. The Chinese citizenship law followed the principle of Jus Sanguinis, right of blood. Uh, any child who was born in the Indies were still considered Chinese national as long as the child has Chinese parents, which is con contradicted with the national law of the Dutch East Indies, which followed the Jude Solid principle, right of soil. Any child born in the Indies were automatically considered as Dutch subjects. Although the two sides signed the 1911 Consular Convention 
which essentially limited the jurisdiction of the Chinese consul in the Indies. But a lot of ambiguity still remain. And first of all, uh, but Anagan, the local born Chinese, can still reclaim Chinese citizenship in under circumstances. And after entering the Republic period, Guomindang councils continue to register Anakan Chinese as Chinese citizen. And a lot of business people actually took advantage of the situation, and both Anakan and Toto regarded obtaining multiple nationalities as a pragmatic strategy to maximize their economic interests. So not only was there divide between Pranaka and Toto, and uh, the boundary between the two groups are very blurry. And there were also political cleavages within the Pranakan community. Uh, first of all, there was three streams of uh, Pranakan groups in Dutch East Indies. The first group is a pro-Dutch Zhonghua Hui. Uh, they are basically Dutch educated elites who established this first Indies Chinese organization in 1928. And the second stream is Bardai Dionghua Indonesia, which is a group of middle class Peranakan who supported the independent struggles of the indigenous. And the third group was the so called Xinpo group which was never a formally established organization, but they were very important because uh, they run the most important Chinese newspaper in the Indies. And all three forces started to organize anti-Japanese campaigns after the mid-1930s to win hearts and minds of the overseas Chinese and also to gain wider support from the increasingly nationalistic Chinese community. Among the three, the Xinbao group stand out and played the most important role in the national salvation movement in the Dutch East Indies. However, on the Dota sides, their campaigns were less effective. Although the new immigrants were eager to participate in the national salvation movement, the effectiveness of their campaigns was severely constrained by their lack of influence over the mostly Peranakan dominated Chinese community in Java. They certainly organized boy boycott campaigns against Japanese goods, but such campaigns were usually not very successful. They also tried to emulate uh, what Tankaki had been doing in Malaya. But recruitment of Qigong, the volunteer drivers and the mechanics, never materialized in Java. Uh, so in the end, the fundraising campaigns were comparatively more successful in the capital city Batavia, which was the stronghold of the Xingbao group. But such campaigns were not very successful in the second largest city Surabaya and Samarang another important port city. And coincidentally, these two cities happen to be the headquarters of the Zhonghua Hui, the pro-Dutch Chinese group and the pro-independence Chinese group. And equally important is the Dutch attitude uh, we have discussed about the shifting British attitude before, and here we can see the distinction. The Dutch colonial government saw the national salvation movement as exerting dangerous influence over the native population, and potentially the Dutch colonial administration believed that such movement could stimulate the rise of the indigenous nationalist movement at an even larger scale. Uh, as a result, the administration uh, implemented the so-called Paris Bridal, the press restraint against anti-Japanese newspapers such as Xinbao and Tianshengrubao and Dagongshangbao. Uh, 
The first belong to the Xingbao group, and the second and the third belong to other Buddha Akan groups. And interestingly, native-run newspapers such as Indonesia Muda, All Isla, and Masyarakat suffered similar price bridles for publishing anti-colonial articles during the same period. The different thing is the experience of the Japanese or Japanese Malay newspapers. While the government temporarily suspended the Japanese Malay newspaper such as Sinar Sladan or Tohindo Nippo, but the level of punishment they received by the pro-Japan uh, press was incommensurable to their Chinese counterparts. It was not until late 1941 when Dutch declared war against Japan after the attack on Pearl Harbor that this Japanese newspaper received more severe treatment. Before that, uh, such punishment was virtually non-existent. In Java, the most important leader for the National Salvation Movement was arrested, and this man was uh, Toto, businessman, Zhong Sigan. He was arrested in December 1937. Uh, although he was soon released by the colonial authority, the colonial official, uh, Lofink, who was the head of the Bureau for East Asian Affairs, gave such comments. Uh, Lofink said, Given his personality, uh, Zhong Sigan's personality, and his undesirable action in the Dutch colony, as well as his role in China's National Political Council, it will be highly possible that he will not only take actions in China that are directed against the policy of the Dutch Indies government concerning the Chinese population here, but will also return to the colony with assignments the execution of which will be harmful to the public order. Here we can see that unlike the National Salvation Movement in Malaya, the movement in Java didn't obtain the leeway from the colonial government. And the government basically uh, maintained the neutral stance. And in this part, I'm going to talk about my major observations. So in sum, the National Salvation Movement in Malaya was far more successful than that of Java. The size of the Chinese population in the two colonies was comparable to each other, but the size was not a determining factor in influencing the outcome. Instead, the National Salvation Movement's outcomes differed, but they were closely associated with the composition of the Chinese population. The Chinese population in Malaya was dominated by the new immigrants, and the Chinese population there accounted for almost 40% of the total population. Therefore, the new immigrants could exert more significant influence, not only within the Chinese community, but also beyond. But in Dutch Java, the Chinese population only accounted for less than 2% of the total population. And within the Chinese community, the overwhelming majority were still the local born who concerned less about the political situation in China, thus did not participate in the National Salvation Movement very actively like their Malayan counterparts. What we see on the ground is actually far more complex than this Buranakan Toto divide. Uh, in Malaya, although factionalism still persisted within the Chinese society, Toto business tycoons such as Tankaki managed to lead the movement thanks to his personal prestige, especially prestige within the Fujianese community. And this prestige also extends to the more extensive Chinese networks throughout Southeast Asia. By contrast, the National Salvation Movement in Java lacked a central leadership 
besides the existing Toto Peranakan division, competitions between and within three Peranakan groups also complicated the movement in the colonial society. So basically, Toto were interested in organizing the national salvation movement, but they were hardly the most important force in the political life of uh, the Chinese in Dutch East Indies. And although uh, political activities in the Indies were dominated by the local born Peranakans, and there were fierce competitions between different groups, and within groups, there are also personal feuds, which I talked about in my paper but uh, did not elaborate in the presentation. And thirdly, attitude matter. Uh, in Malaya, anti-Japanese activities gained certain leeway from the British colonial government as Japanese aggressions in China started to threaten British interests in the entire Far East. So the vision of threats from the British perspective was more imminent and is more significant. So the British government took actions early in letting the Chinese community leaders to organize the National Salvation Movement. By contrast, the Dutch colonial government implemented stricter policies to restrain the National Salvation Movement in Java because their security concerns primarily focus on domestic issues. First is the stability of the colony, and second, as Nazi started occupation in the Netherlands, the focus started to shift towards the European battlefield. It was not until late 1941 and early uh, 1942 that the Dutch government started to uh, declare war against the Japanese, but was, that was too late and uh, the colony was, uh, the government, the Dutch government was defeated uh, in a matter of a uh, few months. And generally speaking, the National Salvation Movement did not affect the course of the war in any significant way, but it affect how the Japanese treated Chinese communities in different places after the occupation began. Uh, for example, the Japanese launched radical purchase against those who involved in anti-Japanese activities. Uh, this was particularly serious in Singapore, where the casualty was very high. Uh, in comparison, the Chinese community in Java received re relatively lenient treatment, and a lot of business elites was were very quick to adapt and uh, they start to form new business and the political connections with the new government and the, throughout the occupation uh, we do not see very high casualty of the Chinese community and it is very different from the traditional Chinese language discourse uh, which primarily depict the overseas Chinese as a monolithic group who suffered and uh, who uh, act uh, patriotically uh, towards China. And I'll end my presentation here, and uh, I'd like to take questions in the comments. Thanks.